no pain, no gain. This popular slogan has been described as a modern American mini narrative, and I grew up with it. But when it comes to training the body to endure, to run, ski, cycle, row, or swim faster, longer, this slogan and the recipe for development that it suggests is just wrong, destructively wrong. 25 years ago, I moved to Norway, and about all I took with me was my physiology training, my interest in endurance, and that no pain, no gain idea that I had grown up with. Norway is a great place to study endurance because endurance sports are very popular, and Scandinavia in general has a long reputation in exercise physiology research. So when I arrived, I was keen to bring local athletes into the laboratory and study them in the way that I had been trained. But then, two random events happened that forced me to re-examine what I thought I knew about the endurance training process and also how it should be studied. First, I was jogging out on forest trails near my home and I saw a woman running in front of me. I recognized her because we had tested her in the laboratory and I knew she was a well-trained endurance athlete, better trained than me. But what she did next surprised me. She came to the bottom of a short but steep hill and instead of running up the hill, she started walking briskly. And then when she reached the top, she continued running again. Now, personally, I have never met a hill during training that I didn't at least try to run up, panting and straining all the way. No pain, no gain. So why did this woman, who was well-trained, choose to walk instead of run that day? And then, later, I was reading a newspaper article in an interview of the national team cross-country skiing coach at the time. He was the coach of true titans of endurance with Olympic gold medals and off-the-charts laboratory test results on the resume. But he said, we do not train at medium-hard intensity. It's too much pain for too little gain. To quantify endurance training, you have to accurately measure the two fundamental variables that combine to make up every endurance training workout. Intensity and duration. Duration is easy, but intensity is, is more challenging because we can measure intensity from two perspectives, external and internal. External intensity or workload is just the pace or power that we produce. 200 watts on a bicycle, for example. But that same external intensity can produce very different internal workloads or uh, physiological responses in an athlete or when, when comparing across athletes depending on the physical capacity at the time. When we have endurance athletes of all ability levels come into the laboratory and exercise at increasing intensities and then measure these physiological responses such as oxygen consumption, ventilation, heart rate, and blood lactate, three distinguishable intensity zones emerge. And I'm going to call them green, yellow, and red, pretty simple. Green, low intensity, low perceived exertion, relatively comfortable talking pace. Yellow, somewhat hard to hard, short response only, and kind of high perceived exertion. And then red, hard, high intensity, <gasps> one more minute, gasping pace. So using these three intensity zones from care careful physiological testing, we then have cooperated with scientists from different countries and we've quantified the training of hundreds of athletes in cycling, cross-country skiing, rowing, and distance running. And we can ask the question, is no pain, no gain, the way the best athletes train? The answer is no, absolutely not. This is the basic intensity distribution that emerges from studying the best in the world across different sports, different countries, male and female. About eight out of every 10 of their training sessions, many training sessions, are performed in their green zone. Now the rest can be quite demanding, but it's like that Norwegian coach said so many years ago, the best athletes don't train very much in that medium intensity zone. Let's look at a few examples. This is Marit Bjorgen. She's the all-time Winter Olympian, male or female eight gold, four silver, and three bronze medals. She allowed sports scientists in Norway to 
digitize and analyze her entire training career and publish it internationally. And one of the scientists that was involved was a former national team teammate who became a doctoral student. I thought that was pretty cool. Here is her endurance training intensity distribution during her five most, most successful years of competition. Hundreds of hours spent in the green zone build the foundation for those red zone performances that were among the best in the history of the sport. Here's another example from Kenyan distance runners, 5,000 and 10,000 meter specialists, 85% of their training green zone. Here's another example. This is from professional cyclists, data collected recently by Dutch sports scientists that I know. And these data have kind of become my favorite from a reason that will become clear in a moment. Four years of data, I'm gonna capsulize in just two numbers, 191 watts and 65% of maximum heart rate. That was the average external and internal workload these professional cyclists trained at over the course of an entire year. Now, to put those green numbers into perspective, these same professional cyclists during a hard race may maintain 300 watts for four or five hours during a breakaway, and they may climb Alpine Mountain Passage in 400, at 450 watts and near maximum heart rate for half an hour. So we now have a good understanding of how the best endurance athletes train when they've got the time and resources to train as hard and as much as they can. They do not train in the yellow zone, in the red zone every day, because they can't. They train a lot, yes, and sometimes they push themselves to levels of exertion and fatigue that most of us will never experience. But on most days, they train in the green zone at an intensity that is relatively comfortable for them that they can go for a long time and recover and repeat day after day, and that's what brings success. Years ago, I, I coined the term polarized training. Lots of low intensity training sessions, some high intensity training sessions, but not too much in the middle. It's like that female athlete that walked up that steep hill that day. It was an easy training day. So why does this polarized approach seem to work better than training harder more often and maybe less overall? Well, for the highest performance levels to be attainable over time, the process itself, the training process has to be sustainable. Athletes have learned that some low intensity days, some high intensity days, seems to give an optimal balance between adaptive signal and systemic stress. No pain, no gain is false. Time-stressed amateurs often in their effort to get the most out of every training minute end up in a kind of regression towards the mean where every training session becomes kind of hard and with very little variation. It's as if there's a training intensity black hole that develops up in our brain and it pulls our good training intentions into a chronic grind in the yellow zone. But when we slow down on most days and maybe go longer and then train hard on some days because we've got the energy and motivation to, to do it, performances get better and the process is more enjoyable and sustainable.